Welcome to the Pod of Inquiry, pushing the envelope for human understanding and optimization, the podcast for podiatrists. The Pod of Inquiry is designed to empower you with knowledge. What happens from there is up to you. Your host, Dr. Stephen Barrett, has designed this show to take you down some very deep rabbit holes, hopefully bringing you back out again, relatively unscathed, but cerebrally whipped, enabling a better understanding of all things worthy of inquiry. If you have more questions after the show, then that is good. The new discovery today many times was the new discovery 50 years ago, only to be suppressed or plainly ignored. Medicine and surgery can sometimes take a long while to get their paradigm shifted. We hope to have a lot of fun on this show and maybe destroy some ridiculous dogma along the journey. Thanks for joining the show today. Let's start spelunking. It's my absolute pleasure to introduce today's guest of the Pot of Inquiry. Not only is our guest today a very good friend of mine, but he's a colleague who I greatly admire for his intellect, his dedication to serving others, and his passion for peripheral nerve surgery. My guest today is Dr. James Wilton, and he is truly one of the absolute stars of our profession. He's a board-certified foot and ankle surgeon and specializes in lower extremity peripheral nerve surgery. He is a gifted surgeon and teacher. Jim serves others more than most people I know. He developed and is directing ongoing medical and surgical mission trips to South America for pediatric orthopedic, reconstructive, and peripheral nerve surgery. Dr. Wilton is a member of the American Society for Peripheral Nerve and the Association of Extremity Nerve Surgeons. He serves as a member of the Board of Trustees for the Association of Extremity Nerve Surgeons and is an esteemed faculty member of that organization. He leads surgical missions to Guayaquil, Ecuador for peripheral nerve surgery, and in this great discussion that we have, we talk about his work in Ecuador, how decompression surgery for patients suffering from leprosy or Hansen disease works, and so much more. So without any further introduction, please enjoy my conversation with my friend and respected colleague, Dr. James Wilton. All right. Good afternoon. Uh, welcome to the Pata Inquiry. I've got Dr. James Wilton, who is a good friend of mine and colleague, and uh, thanks for coming on, Jim. Really appreciate uh, you taking the time. Well, thank you so much, Steve, for having me. All right. Well, let's talk about what you do down in Ecuador and uh, how you got started doing that, because I think the uh, audience will find that very fascinating. Yeah, it's interesting. Uh, uh event. As I tell all my children, life is a nonlinear event and you start in one direction and you end up somewhere else and you say, how did I ever get here? And right. around 2001, I was uh, approached by one of our orthopedic surgeons who had done a medical mission trip to Ecuador. And he was in, he was uh, implanting total knees. And he said, hey, there's all these little kids with clubfoot deformities and things like that. Do you think you could come down and help out on our next trip? And I said, yeah, that would be great. And love to do it because we had done a lot of that in our uh, residency training. Unfortunately, the Saturday we were to leave was the Saturday after 9-11. So mm -hmm. that kind of got scrubbed. So I went the next year. And when I went down to Ecuador, the person who helps transition the teams in is Sister Annie Credidio. She's a uh american uh, citizen she's in the blessed virgin mary order she's a nun who works down there and she's worked with uh, hansen patients or leprosy patients uh for the last 30 years and i first met her in 2002. Uh, she would do all the diplomatic work to get the teams into the country and set us up at the hospitals and so i was doing pediatric trips for clubfoot correction for a couple of years and I was looking at her patients that had uh, neuropathic problems in the clinic, uh, mm -hmm. the Hansen patients. And I said, you know, boy, this is just like diabetes, the presentation of this. And I said, I had just taken a course with Lee Dellen and you. <laughs> and I said, you know, I think there might be a role for what we do with this group of people because very similar uh, nerve afflictions in terms of sensory loss and motor loss, but it's a little more profound in the Hansen patients. So I asked our surgical team and I said, hey, would you guys want to switch gears and go from pediatrics to working with adults? And they fell in love with Sister Annie and the patients. And uh, we've been down 17 times since then. So it was a very 
just kind of casual observation that led us to doing this. And uh, we developed a really good program down there with um, uh, some through four of the hospitals and then her clinic. She sees about 500 outpatients a year with newly diagnosed leprosy or Hansen's disease. And then uh, they have an internist on staff who medically works the patients up and they're all treated outpatient. She does have about 80 residents. They have nowhere else to go. So okay. that's kind of so, our base of operations. So then prior to you going down, leprosy or Hansen's patients, and it, let's focus on the neuropathic component of their disease. Um, prior to you going down there, there, there was not anybody doing decompressions on leprosy patients. Is that correct? Or uh, no, not not in Ecuador. Occasionally in Brazil, they have a large population in Brazil. And there was some work done in the 70s in Spain uh, with a lot of the immigrants coming out of Africa um, okay. from the colonies where they were doing some decompressions, but they weren't getting really good results. But we think in reviewing those articles, you know, they're 50 years old now, they really weren't doing the complete decompressions that you and Lee Dellen taught us how to do. And we, we work on both arms and legs. I have hand surgeons that go down with us. So we really do complete decompressions. And the results that we see are very different than what was published in the 70s. But there still had to be uh, this. Somebody had to come up with the, the concept that, OK, maybe we have an edematous component to this nerve, which is causing a, a superimposed nerve compression, similar to what we see in diabetic peripheral neuropathy, where you know, we're not really treating uh, diabetic peripheral neuropathy. We're treating the superimposed nerve compression. So, right. th so really the only, I guess we'd have to say, all right, in Hansen's disease, which I've done a little research so that I could converse with you semi-intelligently. And it appears to, <laughs> it appears that about, uh, about 70% of patients that uh, get infected with the mycobacterium leprae will develop some type of neuropathic symptom. So it's a, it's a pretty significant proportion uh, of the patients that, that are infected with the agent that then subsequently uh, develop the neuropathy. Uh, but I guess to circle back, somebody had to make the, draw the conclusion that maybe there is an edematous uh, component to this. So we know that, you know, from a physiological standpoint, if they're infected with this mycobacterium, there's a lot of inflammatory cytokines, lots of deposition of macrophages, uh, tumor necrosis factor alpha, all of these different things that are setting up the neuropathic process. But there has to be an edematous um, component to that. Maybe similar, you know, to the fact that in diabetic peripheral neuropathy, no, we're not treating their blood sugar. We're not maybe treating what's going on at a cellular level. We're treating the fact that it's an edematous situation and the, the fat nerves getting stuck in a tight tunnel. It's actually, it's actually a body reaction. Uh, the mycobacterium leprae has a very specific biochemical attachment to the Schwann cell. Okay. And it is temperature related in that it has to be in a cooler area of the body it so can't be would... you don't you don't see this in the central <laughs> in the brain and the in the spinal cord you do see it in the coolest areas of the body and that's the cubital tunnel at the elbow median nerve at the wrist tibial nerve at the tarsal tunnel common perineal nerve at the fibular canal and what happens with these patients there's three forms of hansen's disease you can get there is the tuberculoid Mm -hmm. which has solitary lesions. That's the best kind to get if you're going to get it. That there has a, a lower load, right? Bacterial low, load? Lower load. Okay. Then you have a dimorphic form, which is a little bit of tuberculoid and it's a little bit lepromatous. And then at the other end of the spectrum, you have a lepromatous, which is much worse. These patients have much severe problems from disfigurement, facial disfigurement, mm -hmm. facial nerve disease. Uh, you name it, they get it. And so really depending on the type of Hansen's disease that you have really in many ways indicates the severity of the nerve disease. The tuberculoid patients don't seem to get as bad of sensory and motor loss in our mm -hmm. experience of so the hundreds of patients we've dealt with. 
<clears throat> and when they're treated, uh, it's a one to three year multi, multi um, antibiotic therapy regimen that they're put on. And the tuberculoid patients can do about one year. And I'm okay. generalizing. The right. low chromatist patients need generally a full three years. Wow. Okay. And what you know, it's really interesting in the treatment. I would bring up um, thalidomide that was uh, banned in the 1960s mm -hmm. for the teratogenic effects of the drug. Right. is extremely effective against mycobacterium leprae, and it has been brought back to use in that subgroup of patients that are obviously not of childbearing age, and they don't have to worry about, uh, you know, fetal issues. Right. It, it is very effective in treating this disease. So where when you're getting these patients from a surgical nerve decompression standpoint, have they, they're pretty far down the line in their treatment, or they completed that, that treatment? They, where- where correct. are they? The, yeah, correct. They've completed that. We we don't operate on actively treated patients because they have a lot of uh, reactions uh, during the the course of their therapy. And it, it, from a medical standpoint, we want all that behind us. Um, so what happens is with these patients, they go through one to three years of multi drug therapy. The <laughs> mycobacterium are killed. They are okay. still attached to the swan cells on the nerves. Is that and an what, antigen? That's attached uh, well, to it? It is, it, well, it is antigenic, but what happens yeah. is the body at some point at a later time tries to kill and remove these bacterial um, shells. And that's what creates these intense reactions on the nerves. So ironically, the treatment in medicine for you know the past 80, 100 years for these people is to throw steroids at them and treat these inflammatory reactions, not surgically decompress the nerves. And so, so I can see where, you know, there's a lot of cellular uh, mediated response that, you know, is going to perpetuate this tissue damage, uh, like, a you know, a, a transfusion type right. phenomena. Uh, so it would, it, it would seem that maybe a steroid in conjunction with all of the other treatment might not be a bad idea. Is that misguided? Well, I think well, I think it's it's probably a logistical question. A lot of these patients are treated in really poor areas. You know, mm -hmm. we're talking India, Brazil. So you don't have surgical capabilities. These are outpatient clinics. So it's easy to use oral steroids to treat these. And that's kind of the treatment. And, you know, it's kind of, you know, like when you introduce your, your podcast, you know, you talk about the dogmas of medicine and surgery and how they can take 50 years to really be appreciated. Right. It's a lot easier from our standpoint to decompress a nerve and do an epineurolysis to release the pressure in the nerve for a mechanical fix than to continue to throw steroids at these patients and still have the mechanical damage. Right. Well, I'm not saying that, the, you know, don't misunderstand my question, negating the, the power of decompression, because we know how much a focal compression can lead to, you know, focal right. nerve damage. Um, I was just saying that maybe in, you know, because if you look in the literature, they they do use a usually a multi drug approach, and then maybe sometimes they'll throw a steroid in, sometimes they won't. But right. I want to go back to something you said. Should the paradigm maybe shift a little bit that you start hitting these folks with nerve decompression earlier, uh, <clears throat> while they're still going through their treatment, because you would potentially eliminate that mechanical sequela. Well, it's, it seems as though the mechanical sequela doesn't happen until a long time after they're finished their multi-drug therapy. Okay. We don't, we don't see this per se with actively treated patients that have a new diagnosis of a Hansen's disease. Um, so I don't know. I think the concern is during the therapy, um, medically, if, you know, we don't want these patients to go into these uh, reactions and they can be quite severe. Uh, during their multi-drug therapy as these, you know, bacteria are being killed, if some are released, it really is an intense inflammatory reaction they can get. They get a Herxheimer type reaction. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, so, yeah. yeah, we just, you know, we said, look, when we've set up the program, we would really prefer to look at people that have finished, completed their therapy. And so how do you approach them then as far as uh, do you start off with their lower extremities and then go to their upper extremities or some probably are more affected in upper or lower? What's the distribution of what you're seeing down there? Well, I'll tell you, for people that have nerve affections, it affects the upper and lower extremity. So we do, uh, Scott Nickerson came down the first couple trips and really 
you know, beat me to a pulp on how to do an upper extremity exam. And, and then so we just started doing it. And I had Phil Anderson, who was a general surgeon who, you know, he's retired now. Phil used to go down with me and we would, uh, you know, on our screening trips, we go through 100 or 130 patients and we'll call out about 30. And for the majority of patients, I would say 70% were operating on arms and legs at the same time, contralateral limbs, so we can we don't bump into each other on the surgical table and it works out really well. So you'll do uh, a, a right upper extremity, a left lower extremity, and then bring them back Correct. the next time you guys are down there. And, and, yeah. uh, and uh, we really wanted to get a lot of bang for the buck because you never know if you, you'll ever be back again, you know? So well, it was, yeah. uh, so yeah. you, you really want to try to do as much as you can safely. And, and as you know, these procedures when done and trained hands are very safe, right. I think out of, you know, I, I ran some stats on what we had. We operated on well over 200 people. I think we had one post-operative infection wow. that was easily treated with antibiotics. That's fantastic. Um, and you think in sometimes in these uh, more impoverished areas, your infection rate would be higher rather than lower. Well, we lock them down <laughs> after surgery. They go back to the foundation and they stay there for two weeks. We, we own them. Yeah. Yeah. We, we raise money for their families because most of these these folks are very poor. They live in the outlying country they make you know one to three dollars a day working in the rice and banana fields so we will supplement their salary so that their families can you know eat and wow they don't have to worry about it no that's fantastic now are you going down every year yeah we were doing two trips a year and then covid hit and our last trip was in 17 and then we i switched hospitals and so that just put a little bug in the rug and we've been unable to go back because of covid and okay. then last year we were going to go and there's been a huge uptick in crime in the country. And uh, you may have heard, I think a week ago, the presidential candidate was just assassinated in Quito. No, I did the, not hear that. The wow. country has just fallen into anarchy. And so we're just kind of, the people down there are saying it's, it, they really don't want us to come down, although they have a backlog of patients, of hundreds of patients for us. So we're trying to figure out a good way to do it. Yeah. Well, you can't jeopardize your own safety. Yeah. And if they're telling you not to come down, then that's probably a pretty strong indication that yeah. uh, all is not well, but uh, yeah. interesting. So what's the success rates um, as far as reestablishment? It, do they have more motor affectation than sensory or is it pretty much equal? How, how would you how would you categorize their general symptoms? Pain is number one because okay. these nerves, you know, the, there's a large sensory component in these nerves and Pain is number one. Um, inability to, with motor weakness, really looking at the upper extremity. Um, our youngest patient, she was 18. She was a mother. Uh, she couldn't um, hold a comb in her hand uh, to brush her hair or to take care of her baby. We see those kind of things. That completely reverses. Wow. Uh, they'll, they'll get their motor strength back. Yeah. And we've actually operated on a, a gentleman who was 90 um, we, we really couldn't return the motor component, but his sensory pain was gone. Okay. So we were able to do that. So that's good. Right. We're really looking at restoring some sensation to prevent the terrible ulcerations and limb loss in this group of people. So it's similar to what we see in, in diabetic peripheral neuropathy cases where, you exactly. know, we do, we do pretty well with, uh, pain and, well, we do really very well with pain if you look at it from a statistical standpoint. And we do pretty good with uh, um, improving their motor function. It's the uh, sensory restoration that is a little bit uh, lagging. But even that is still pretty good in the in the diabetic patients. And I think I haven't looked at the stats for a long period of time, but it's about 75% you can get some reestablishment, at least a protective sensation may not be normal sensation and greater than 90% reduction of of pain or elimination of pain. So, you know, I think we don't see as good a results because I think the mechanism of the disease is a little more severe than diabetes because mm -hmm. the nerve is actually being attacked in Hansen disease with this inflammatory response. But I can say that the amputation rates on the patient we've op have operated on are excellent. So I don't yeah. know of any of our patients that have gone on to limb, limb amputation. That's fantastic. It 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 I it makes me circle back to how much of the, you know, uh, how much is the contributory um, problem coming from the superimposed compression versus the you know 
the let's call it just for lack of a better way, the endogenous disease in the nerve itself from the mycobacterium. But right. uh, I, I, I was in, in doing my prep for this. Uh, some of the more recent literature, they still say they're not completely sure about the, the mode of transmission. They think it's nasal droplets. Any insight into that? Yeah, it, it really seems the folks that we see come from small familial clusters. And yeah. a common thread is a lot of these people, they don't have a lot to eat and they eat armadillos. Okay. And that's that's the native reservoir. And it's probably undercooked or less than perfectly cooked meat that's infected. That's probably the way. But, but there's also, there has to be a genetic familial component for a weakness in the immune system to really see this or address this infection. Because in healthcare workers, it's not transmitted. You don't see it. So for the people that are working with these newly acquired infectious people, <clears throat> right? Uh, the transmission rate is almost non-existent. So maybe when they're preparing the armadillo for the barbecue, that's when they're getting the, uh, the mycobacterium. I think and so. They, you know, they might be cooking it just fine, but you know, heck in the prep, they're getting that stuff on their hands and maybe in their nasal passages and who knows so, what, but. So uh, we try to stay away from that when we go out to eat. Yeah. You know, the armadillo is kind of a prehistoric beast. We have, you know, and those damn things will tear up our lawns down here. I don't know if you have them up in New Hampshire, but we have, no. a, we have a fair amount of them here in Georgia, believe it or not. Really? And uh, Oh yeah. In fact, I was letting my dog out about three weeks ago and uh, she saw three armadillos and, and went after them. Yeah, just like they just, you know, sauntered off at what they weren't really scared of her. And she was, you know, s smart enough to to come back in. But it's like, don't tangle with those, you know. <laughs> yeah, but uh, <laughs> yeah, but they uh, they love to eat grubs in the uh, grass. So the way you have to keep the armadillos and they really will tear up your lawn incredibly right. get, getting these grubs. But you just have to keep, you know, spraying the different stuff to keep the grubs coming in. Uh, from coming in and then that that decreases the armadillos but i think that's why probably you know the hansen's disease center was down in carville um louisiana right. because they got a lot of armadillos down there you know yeah so. well we see it, traditionally in the u.s there's about 200 new diagnosed cases a year and i think there's six centers run by the federal government they have one in boston but all those folks are um it's really interesting that they're, they're immigrants that come in from these countries, Brazil, India, okay, um, other South American countries where it's endemic. And they the a commonality is that these people are kind of carriers, their immune system is keeping it at bay, but the stress of assimilation into a North American culture, which is very different, different climate, different language, it decreases their immune system and then the the disease presents itself. It's right. very interesting. Well, there was something the CDC for whatever value they still have anymore. Um, it came out with something a few weeks ago uh, about an uptick in cases in Florida. And um, it was not a significant amount of cases, but I think it was like 18 or 19 cases and 181 cases in Florida total or something for the year. Uh, it, but they, there was, I didn't see anything where they gave a, a demographic breakdown of where these, right. you know, were these folks migrants or, or, what well what i just saw where they they had a dengue fever outbreak in fort lauderdale yeah uh, last week in the last yeah. couple of weeks and that's probably brought from immigrants right it's not native to florida so people that are infected then they come to florida they're bit by a mosquito and then it goes through the system and multiplies before we continue with this great discussion i just want to take a quick break to acknowledge this week's sponsor i'm excited to announce that we have a new sponsor for the show Dr. Ed Glazer's Relax, Release, Relief Technique and Training is now a sponsor of the Pod of Inquiry. I call his technique the Triple R Technique, and it's truly amazing. He has actually performed it on me. By asking your patient to point where it hurts and have them tell you what motion hurts them, you will know exactly how to position them. They will then lightly push against your very focused light pressure, so minimal pressure that they can barely feel anything. A few seconds later, you will feel a softening of their tissues under your fingers as the patient's skin separates from the deep fascia and suddenly slides. This is the release part of the technique called Relax, Release, Relief. It's a deep relaxation technique that reduces or eliminates almost all pain. 
10 minutes after the release, most musculoskeletal pain is gone. The range of motion increases dramatically and permanently for most people. Muscle spasms, including trigger points, are gone. Duration of relief or recurrence is dependent upon the underlying cause of pain, which in most cases has already healed. It does all this by resetting the pain threshold. It's as easy as flipping a switch, and the results are astonishing. I know. I've had the experience myself. What I'm saying is you learn this technique, and you'll be able to relieve a lot of musculoskeletal pain from surgeries, trauma, implants, and other diagnoses, including fibromyalgia and CRPS. Dr. Edward Glazer is the inventor of the Soul Support Mass Posture Orthotic and is teaching the lower and upper body in two weekend courses. I personally have experienced this treatment, as I've said, from Dr. Glazer, and it does relieve pain, and the technique is painless. Space is limited for these courses to 14 students in each class. Just go to rrrtv.net forward slash course or tap the QR code on the screen to register. You'll want to really do this because it will empower you and give you a technique that really helps people and really will differentiate your practice from almost any other practice. Dr. Glazer is teaching two courses. Course one is feet to low back and course two is upper body. Now the first course feet to low back is being offered on October 4th and 5th and November 11th and 12th. And the upper body course is being offered on October 28th and 29th and November 18th and 19th. So go to rrrtv.net forward slash course and get signed up for these today. So this is tangential, but that's why I like these discussions. But when you mentioned the, the predilection of this microbe invading nerves at a lower temperature, common perineal is an an interesting nerve, right? Because mm -hmm. it's millimeters to a centimeter below the skin. It's not, right. not a deep nerve at all. Um, and it's not in a highly vascular bed or anything like that, that would help maintain that temperature. What's your thoughts on Charcot Marie tooth disease? Because it seems to have a predilection for the common perineal and spares the tibial. That's correct. Um, no. I've never read anything in the literature to that effect. But if you look at the CMTD patients, rarely do they have any decrease in motor strength for the, you know, plantar flexors, the posterior calf. They're strong as hell. Why yeah, is absolutely. it? Why is their anterior and lateral compartment get knocked out? And that's only common fibular common perineal nerve. And it's not even, you know, it it just doesn't seem to affect the tibial nerve. Yeah, that'd be interesting if it's temperature yeah. related to some effect. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, it's just something that, you know, pops up into my mind. And I've, I've thought a lot about CMTD and there's not a lot written about it, but I think that you could um, maybe mitigate or maybe even obviate some of the sequela of the, the disease by um, early decompression because the decompression yes. works extremely well for these people. But usually by the time they come in and see you, they're way down the line. They've had this, right. you know, of course it's a genetic disease. We understand that, but it still manifests over a period of time. And, um, I, it, it almost, to me, it, it almost seems like you could, you know, maybe I hate to use the word prophylactic in, in conjunction with a nerve decompression, but you kind of understand where I'm going with that thought process. That oh, if, you intervene, if you intervened a little earlier, you might not have the sequela, the 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 cavus uh, foot um, development, some of the other things. Absolutely, and like you said, by the time we get to see them, it's too late. They've mm -hmm. already had the structural adaptation, and so even if you you increase motor power in the perineals, it wouldn't make any difference. Right. But right. I had a family about fifteen years ago, and um, I treated in two brothers, and I did their commons, and uh, it worked out very well, and they they didn't progress on to you know, bad ulcerations or whatever. Right. Um, they were starting to get structural changes, but they had a lot of pain with it. So, um, but we, we don't have a large population in this area in New Hampshire. Yeah, no, I've, I've got a handful. I wouldn't say it's a lot, but, um, you know, and, and a couple of them were just so far down the line when we we did the decomp decompressions that we did you know, reduce some of the, the uh, pain component, but didn't seem to do much from the motor aspect 
And right. then, you know, shoot, you know, the motor end plates are probably gone and uh, you, you, you really can't expect um, maybe. But if you saw somebody in their 20s and they were diagnosed with CMTD, it would be very interesting to say, well, let's decompress their common and see how they do, you know. Well, but, yeah. uh, I, I think that that thought process is really good because when you look at the temperature, especially with Hansen disease, I well, we don't look for it, but we haven't seen, we haven't read about any brachial plexus, lumbosacral plexus problems, spinal cord problems. Right. Um, so anything outside the blood brain barrier, obviously, but we haven't seen issues at that level. These are all peripheral nerves that are right under the skin. Mm -hmm. So, and that would be, that would make sense with the facial nerves as well. Oh, it's, yeah. it's, it's directly right yeah. under the skin. Right. Yeah. How do you think the, um, the skin lesions relate to the nerve pathology? They've got to be inextricably entwined. Yeah, um, I think so. Not not as much as uh, people that get shingles. When you see right. those patients, they'll have skin lesions on the exact geographic mm -hmm. confines of the nerve that's infected. Right. right. So uh, we don't see it with that because with the with the tuberculoid, the dimorphic, and the lepromatous forms of the disease, there's very different skin manifestations. Um, okay. It is connected, but it can be all over the place on the trunk. And you're not having any sensory or motor areas on these, the intercostal nerves, if they're affected, they're mm -hmm. creating that dermatomal pattern or whatever. Right. So there is some connection, obviously, but nothing that we could say, oh, there's a skin lesion, that specific nerve is affected. It'd be interesting, maybe with thermography to see what the temperature difference is from like, let's say the tibial nerve at the level of the soleal sling versus right. the common fibular nerve that would be kind of a fun thing i'll have to maybe get my my nerve fellow to to start playing with the thermographic camera and, oh it's uh, got to be yeah. degrees got, warmer yeah yeah you know because they, they say like in uric acid deposition you know uric acid crystallizes at 10 degrees roughly below the core temperature of your body and that 10 degrees difference is your foot yeah but that 10 degrees is a lot yeah i mean you know, you stick your body in 88 degree water. I mean, it feels cold, even though it's 88 at, you know, the initial exposure. So yeah. it's pretty interesting. Um, so what, uh, what's, what's the future for, have you had any, um, thoughts about publishing some of the data that you've, you've had on this? Because I think you're probably the guy for this. Well, we, it's funny you should ask that. We just had an article submitted for publication Wednesday in the um, Journal of Plastic and Reconstructive Surgery. It's an open journal. And um, Lee's on that. And one of the uh, medical students, Eric Wan, if you had met him, he worked with Lee doing some statistical analysis on our patients down there. Uh -huh. And it's really talking about uh, neuroplastic procedures for Hansen patients. And it's listed different centers in um, Europe, um, Africa, South America, where the people can get more information on this to get the word out. Right. So that, that yeah. paper will be big because there's really, <clears throat> to yeah. my, I didn't find any um, articles specifically with nerve decompression in relationship to Hansen's um, no. in my search. So no, that's the next thing on the horizon then to just really boil down and uh, Eric or Eric Wan has a lot of that data. So Right. I'm anxious to see that when, yeah. it, when you get that, send me a text so I can pull that. Yeah. Love, down. love to. Yeah. It's, um, yeah. you know, when you go through the Cochrane database on this stuff, it kind of says, man, you know, there might be some benefit, but you know, there's always the, you know, but the, in the review of what's in the Cochrane database or what they looked at, we, a lot of us feel that are doing this work, that these were incomplete decompressions. Mm-hmm. You know, they were just doing the like the, the tarsal tunnel. They weren't really going into the medial and lateral plantar nerves or going proximally in the leg. I don't know how far they were going on the, the divisions of the common perineal nerve once you get past the fibular canal. Just different, very statistical things. And I know our guys that do the upper extremity, the you know the ulnar and median nerves, we do the radial nerve. Uh, they do really complete decompressions. Yeah. So, so in the lower extremity, uh, are you doing the superficial uh, fibular or, or superficial common or com the common and then the superficial um, fibular at the foraminal level 
or do you base, or do you differentiate from patient to patient based on their, their clinical signs, provocation sign or? Well, a lot of it goes, you know, if the folks are older and they've had ulcerations or they have really bad lichenification of the skin, we're going to stay away from those areas right. for healing. So it's not always a hundred percent of the nerves that we can do. The patients right. are not good candidates to have that. In the patients that are good candidates, we try to do the carceral tunnel, deep perineal nerve, superficial perineal nerve, um, soleal sling, and um, common fibular to get And those. that's that's a pretty complete decompression. It, it really is. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um, very interesting. Are, are there some folks that you just did the common because of the lichenification? And, oh, yeah. And how did, we, they do, how did they do? I mean, I, I would assume they probably had a pretty integral effect. Uh, once again, they're from a pain standpoint, these patients do extremely well. Their, their pain is gone and it's pretty debilitating for these, these patients. Uh, I'm not really too much concerned with sensation on the top of the foot. It just no. doesn't make that much of a difference. Right. And there are some people we would love to do their tibial nerve distally, but we just can't because of the quality of the skin. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you, you can decompress the nerve, but can you ever get the skin to heal? That's right. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's a nightmare. Yeah. Do do no harm, I think, is the right. is the better. Well, I think that's what's so powerful with the more proximal um, nerve decompressions. I mean, even even if you take the tibial nerve at the soleal sling, or you know, uh, Doctor Ellison, Payman Ellison has talked a lot about you know his more proximal tibial nerve releases with known tarsal tunnel and. They seem to do, a, a, I forget his statistics, but they seem right. to do pretty darn well. And, you know, so right. there's a lot of power staying up top because you, you know, don't go into that, uh, that rough neighborhood, so to speak, from a skin standpoint. So, and um, Sunny Yamasaki is doing some very interesting research on looking at doing a soleal sling decompression, looking at the vascular outflow now that the veins aren't compressed. Mm -hmm. And looking at the hemodynamics of that, and it's very exciting. And he's he has approached some cardiac surgeons to look at doing a study for this. Well, I think there's a, a I mean, we see that, I mean, with common fibular nerve decompressions where oh, we even see it with our diagnostic blocks where we'll look at, you know, let's say they're the waveform for their dorsalis pedis artery. And then five minutes later, after we've given them a nerve block, Right. Albeit very, their, their waveform greatly increases. And sometimes they'll go from zero uh, ar arterial evidence on the Doppler to having an artery. So right. there's, you know, you got this very significant autonomic component as well. Not, maybe not just the, the vascular obstructions, but that's a powerful thing because then in combination with the fact that you've improved the nerve function, you've also improved the hemodynamics and now the patient right. gets, you know, gets that but, benefit. But in, in your reference to arterial inflow increases, we've suspected, and now we know that that happens. Right. Sonny's looking at outflow improvements mm. because the vein, the vein really gets compressed at the soleal sling. Right. So when you release that, there's better outflow going out and that, that hemodynamically affects the heart function. Right. So there's going to be some really interesting data if he can get that study going. Oh, that's it. Yeah. Well, Sonny's one of the smartest guys I know. So yeah. uh, if he can get that data, that would be great. I I, I always tell Sonny, like, you're the guy I, I hate to see in physics class on the first day of class with you <laughs> in the class because there's no curve anymore. Yeah, he blows <laughs> the curve. Well, they got to throw out the top and the bottom score. So they throw mine out and they throw <laughs> his out. The rest of the class can do well, right? But uh, <laughs> but yeah, no, that would be great to, to see that. I mean, it's uh, there's so much that you know i remember when you and i started in the nerve world back in the early 2000s and look how much we've learned in 20 years imagine what's going to happen in the next 20. oh my gosh just in the yeah. last five years the things that have changed yeah you know with yeah. peripheral nerve stimulators and just graphs and wraps and things like that it's it's very exciting tmr i mean a lot yeah, yeah no a lot absolutely so, so when you're doing your decompressions for your soleal slings down there. Uh, what's your approach? Medial approach, lateral yeah. approach with the fibula? So you're going I, medial? I go medial. Yeah. You know, I, I had the luxury of working with a vascular surgeon for many years, Phil Anderson, general yeah. vascular surgeon. And, you know, you can't beat that approach. That's the standard approach for 
vascular surgery. And if you have a problem, you just extend the excision right. and you, you can do it. I have worked with Payman and uh, it, when I was teaching the advanced course for up in Portland, thank you for taking it over from me. Yeah. Um, Payman talked me into doing a lateral one when I did a common and it worked. Uh, I felt uncomfortable not being able to see the far side of the sling. I was mm. doing the near side of the sling and I didn't. So, I mean, it worked and it was okay. Um, I'm more of a traditionalist. And when I do a medial approach and I have my special devers that we had made, um, I can, I get a very good exposure and I can see it's just laid out beautifully in front of me. And it's not the incision. That's a problem with patients, right? It's really, it's right. what you it's, do inside. Yeah. Well, you know, I, I'm kind of schizophrenic when it comes to what approach I want to use for a soleal sling. If I'm doing other nerve decompressions and if the patient is a relatively small patient, um, mm -hmm. from an anatomical standpoint, it's not hard to get the, the soleal sling from the lateral, from your common fibular nerve decompression. It's right incision. there. It's right there. It's, it's maybe right a there. centimeter, two centimeters away, but in some of the big legs, you just can't get there. You can't visualize it. And then how many of the little veins do you have to worry about from a post-operative uh, hematoma standpoint? Those are, you know, things uh, that you, you know, so I, I kind of changed the approach depending on the morphology of the patient. Right. So those, those procedures aren't, aren't without harm. And, you know, unfortunately we all do, you know, med mal work. And um, I was involved on in a case where a fellow lost his limb a 26 year old had a above knee amputation because of post-operative bleeding from a, uh, Soleil okay. sling decompression. Oh yeah. That's horrible. That's a horrible, terrible, horrible thing. Um, wow. So no future trips to Ecuador planned at this time. Based I'm on shooting this. for next year. Are I'm you? an optimist and okay. um, I think they're going to get things around. And my, my plan B is we always work in a city called Guayaquil. It's about 4 million. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking of maybe going to Quito. Okay. Uh, it's a little safer. <laughs> Unfortunately, the presidential candidate was assassinated there two weeks ago, but um, it's a little safer. So I'm going to work out with the people there, but I'd really like to go back next year because they have a tremendous backload of patients for right. us. So, well, I'd love to go. Let me know. Yeah, I'd love to have you. We had, I, I did some stats on our teams and over the years I've had five plastic surgeons come down. Mm -hmm. Lee Dillon was the first one. He came down in 2004 and he goes, I just remember, he's like, I've never seen a nerve this big in my life. And he was like a little kid in a candy yeah. shop looking at these yeah. things. You know, we've had two orthopedic hand surgeons work with us, a general surgeon, uh, orthopedic general surgeon who didn't specialize in hands. Six, six of us from the AENS have gone down. Uh, we've had three medical residents, MD residents from the U.S. come down. And we've worked with six Ecuadorian medical students on the medical side. And then we have our own anesthesia team that we bring our own nursing staff. And uh, you, so yeah. the, the people that come down, you really work outside the box because it's not like you're at home and I need this. I need that. You, you right. really have to get along with what you have and do a good job. And um, it, 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 it uh, introduces resourcefulness. Uh, it you, certainly does. I, yeah. I remember I went in the room next door and a, my colleague was putting in total knees and uh, out in the hallway, they had been, there were some plywood sheets and some things like that. And I'm like, Tom, what are you, what are you guys doing? Like you building a new wing on the hospital here? And he goes, no, he said, we're, we're fixing the bed so that we can get a better patient position for my total knees. And they were just using plywood. It was great. Yeah. Now you have to do what you have to do, you know? Yeah. Um, uh, so what about training some of the guys that are down there to, well, we have, are you, are um, you doing that? One of, the, one of the plastic surgeons, um, Andres Rivendera was a fellow, third year fellow at the Luis Vernasa Hospital, a huge hospital we work at. And he, nicest guy in the world, he took uh, uh, a liking to what we did. And uh, my partner in the office, Bob Bassett, who's an orthopedic hand surgeon, uh, went down and he was teaching Andres upper extremity peripheral nerve work. And then we were teaching him and then his fellow residents. And he's really taken over and has been teaching his residents now. He's a member of the Association of Extremity Nerve Surgeons. Um, super nice guy. Um, he he is he's the guy in um, in Ecuador to go to for plastic surgery now from head to toe. But he loves working with these chronic pain patients. And what I really like about Andres is, you know, many of the surgeons down there it's so poor they really don't want to work on the poor patients because they're trying to live too. Right. And Andres sees everybody. There's mm. there's you walk in his door. It doesn't matter who you are. He will take care of you. 
Interesting. Very interesting. Well, we got to chat a little bit about the ANS before we get off because uh, it's a, an organization that's very near and dear to my heart. I know it is for you as well. So yep. um, anybody who uh, needs CME um, should really strongly consider the annual uh, meeting in November. And uh, it'll be unlike anything you go to um, a regular oh. CME meeting. And actually, you'll learn things that are incredibly outside of your normal day to day, but are so powerful and valuable that you'll just, you'll make patients better. You know, it, it, there aren't too many meetings where your notepad is out for every lecture. Yeah. Right. And you're, and you're yeah. trying to just, you know, okay, this is sounds really good. I never thought of that. Let me just look into this and yeah. great speakers. I mean, you know, I got to hand it to you, Steve, you know, I met you back in 96. I took your endoscopic plantar fasciotomy course at a SAM conference in Miami. And throughout your career, you know, everybody's in the boat. And there aren't too many guys that have the courage to walk out of the boat, walk on the water to uncharted waters in the medical and surgical fields. And you have done that for our profession. And I and so many others are so grateful for the leadership that you've given to open up doors to our field that were not open 20 years ago. So my yeah. hat's off to you. Well, I just, thank you, Jim. That's very kind. I, I just have had just such a great adventure. I, I am addicted to learning and it doesn't matter if it's something that is a hundred percent applicable or 1% applicable, or maybe none percent applicable, but the, the, the goal of learning and interacting with these people. And, and, you know, I mean, if you look at the slate of people that we have, you know, coming up uh, for the annual meeting in this November um, right. and the people that we've had the last, really the last five to 10 years, it, they're extraordinary. They're world leaders in their domains and for them to come in. And that's why it's like, I don't see why every podiatrist in the United States or the world for that matter would not want to come to this meeting, even if they don't have a, a maybe a, a, a dedicated direct interest in nerve because these these guys are bringing in stuff that is so out of their normal purview that right. it just expands yeah. their knowledge exponentially over a regular meeting. It just makes you a better diagnostician at the baseline. Right. right. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And the more yeah. you can the more you can diagnose, the more you can fix. But you know, I love these podcasts. You know, I love Andy Rader's two part thing on his. Uh, his <laughs> yeah, I I've got to get Andy back on. He wants to have a a rate a a, a Raider rant episode, and uh, so I'm I'm going to try to get that scheduled in the near future. But uh, yeah, you know, I, I just I'm still scratching my head when he said, "Yeah, I can train a monkey to do a mid tarsal replacement." I'm like, "Yeah, well, yeah, he's right. got okay. well, he's got special monkeys there in so Southern Indiana, right?" So. You know, they're like all top third year residents and, yeah. <laughs> you know, but uh, yeah, no, I love Andy. He's a fantastic individual. And, uh, but uh, Jim, thanks so much for coming yeah. on. I know your, your time is, is, uh, you know, very, very valuable. And uh, I, I, you know, there's not many in the field that I respect more than you and, and for you to take the time and come on the show. It's like, well, it's an honor and, you know, it's great. And it's great to get the word out and hopefully yeah. not that, any podiatrist in America is going to see Hansen disease come across their plate. But if there's any interest in doing medical missions, uh, we, we'd love to take people with us. We well, at the, very, at the very least, they may not see a Hansen disease patient, but they're not going to barbecue that armadillo without their rubber gloves on. Absolutely. Especially if you're you in go. Texas, Louisiana, or Georgia. <laughs> right, exactly. Right. <laughs> so, all right, Jim, thanks, man. I appreciate you. Hey, have a great weekend, Steve. Take you care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Yeah. Well, folks, if you are over 40 and you are not using a supplement to augment nitric oxide production, you should really think that. This molecule is absolutely imperative to health, not to mention its cardio protection. If you have any question on nitric oxide, I suggest that you go back and listen to The Pot of Inquiry, Season 1, Episode 3, for my conversation with one of the world's experts, Dr. Nathan Bryan. I never miss a day of nitric oxide supplementation. That's how important I believe it is. Long overdue, there is now a nitric oxide replenishment formula without the fear of oxalates. Approved Medical Solutions does not use beets, spinach, or arginine. Approved Medical Solutions is proud to offer our audience their oxalate-free nitric oxide formula. 
If you are not a healthcare provider, you can still get started by going to approvedmedicalsolutions.com and use the code SBARRETT, all lowercase, at checkout, and you will receive a 10% medical discount savings. For licensed practitioners, go to approvedmedicalsolutions.com and register. They have unique bundles for all of the full-fledged spelunkers of the pod of inquiry. Use pod of inquiry at checkout after registration, and I'm certain you will be pleased not only for yourself, but all of your patients. Here's a little secret. If you order their testing strips and test every patient for a few clinic days, you will see every one of those patients will be nitric oxide deficient. When they see this result, they will want you to start them up immediately. Now, thanks to approved medical solutions, you can give them the best care without the worry of oxalates. We hope you all enjoyed today's show and got some truly empowering knowledge out of it. You can always follow up on anything we talked about in the show notes, found at our website, potofinquiry.com. If this incredible and educational conversation has tickled just a little bit of your cortex, please leave us a review and spread the message to your friends and colleagues. Let's keep spelunking. This podcast is designed for informational purposes only. It does not constitute any medical or surgical consulting advice or imply a development of any physician-patient relationship. The opinions of guests who are featured on the show are not necessarily the opinions of Dr. Barrett or the production team. This podcast is owned solely by Barrett Medical and Surgical Media, LLC. While the show is highly oriented for physicians and healthcare providers, anyone interested in the improvement of human performance and understanding will find us a welcome goblet to sip from or guzzle. However, no representation or warranties are made in any way whatsoever on this podcast for any products, techniques, or other things discussed. Invited guests are not vetted by the pod of inquiry for their qualifications and may have a direct or indirect financial interest in what they present and discuss on the show. The pod of inquiry disclaims any responsibility from anything taken from the show, if used personally or professionally. It is a responsibility of the listener to perform their own due diligence prior to the implementation of any ideas, products, techniques, or anything talked about on the show.